for Earth Day. All right, it looks like we've got quite a few people here today and I'm appreciating that you're joining us to talk about monarchs and monarch butterflies, one of my very favorite subjects. And you can see the photograph behind me here at Natural Bridges of what it looks like sometimes in the winter time when the butterflies are clustering in the trees. So I really appreciate you joining and we'll just wait another minute until everybody is on. All right, Martha, you are live now. Okay, thank you. Well, my name is Martha and I'm an interpreter here at Natural Bridges State Beach in Santa Cruz. And I'm really excited that you are joining us for Earth Day, one of my favorite days, and also that you're interested in the monarch butterflies. I find it just amazing that we are able to follow the monarch butterflies and their paths now. And there's so much we've learned from the scientists. And also it's exciting because you folks can also help the scientists and also help the monarchs. So that's what we're gonna be sharing a little bit about today. And what I'd like to start with at the very first is a little bit of motion and flight. It's not the season right now for me to have the butterflies. And so what I'd like to do is to ask Jen to share with all of us the hummingbird video. This is just a short clip to give you a feeling about the cold northern winter. How they return to this exact spot is a mystery. Like the butterflies, hummingbirds feed on nectar so our spy isn't seen as a threat. While resting, they cluster together to conserve. So what they're doing in the, with the hummingbird is it's a drone. And it's amazing how technology is now helping us learn more about the monarch butterflies. There was somebody who had a, a glider and he was following the monarch butterflies so he wouldn't disturb them. And now with the drone with, in the shape of a hummingbird, it's not scaring the butterflies apparently. And so that's pretty exciting. Here at Natural Bridges, we're very concerned about the birds and we do find that drones do affect the birds. And so whenever you're doing a study or thinking about using technology, please be really ethical and responsible and careful about what you're studying and how you're studying it. That way we can make sure that what we care about and what we wanna know about, we can protect as well, especially here in parks, that's our goal. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to share some pictures and images with you to share a little bit more about the importance of the monarch butterfly and its role and, um, in some of the science studies and how we can follow it through time. Um, so Jen, if you'll please share the pictures, that would be great. Okay, so now I'm gonna share my screen with you and here we go. So in following the path of the monarchs, the questions that I ask are, where do they go and when? And what's really interesting is some of the ways that we know. And as I mentioned earlier, we rely on people like you to tell us more information so that we know more and the scientists know more. So we appreciate if you like to get involved in this as well. So, so monarch butterflies have captured people's imagination for a long time. They're just these mysterious flyers that come from out of nowhere and descend on where we live. And people have been amazed with wondering where they come from, where they go to, and why they come and spend a little time in their life with our lives. Milkweed is the only plant that monarchs use. And if anybody was involved in the last drawing um, class, what I find really interesting is that there was a 13 year old who was the first one to put together the butterfly, the chrysalis, the caterpillar and the larval host plant, the milkweed for the monarch butterflies as well as about 280 other species of butterflies. Her name was Maria Sibylis Marion. And you know how long ago she lived? About 350 years ago. So you can see that people that are just regular people. She was actually artistic, had an artistic bend. And she decided that this was something she wanted to do was to show, show everybody the importance of these plants and the whole life of the butterflies and how they're all connected. And that's what scientists and community people have been doing since. 
Now, when you see so many of anything, even a small portion of the number of butterflies that come to Mexico, it's just absolutely awe-inspiring. And here at Natural Bridges, people come each year in the wintertime to see the butterflies and to reflect on how beautiful they are and how amazing it is to see them. The butterflies flying through Mexico and through Natural Bridges are amazingly large. I find it wonderful to watch because this huge butterfly is actually about the width from my end of my little finger to my thumb. It's a very, very large butterfly. As it flies, you can actually see shadows. So when you look on the screen and you see these dark spots, these are other butterflies above this butterfly flying and these are all their shadows on the ground. Scientists always wanna know if it's a male or a female when they're doing the studies, um, for certain studies, and it's always helpful to know which is what. So the female is on the left here, if you aren't aware of that, maybe you were, good for you if you were. And you can notice the difference in the black lines. These are above the veins um, and the width of them on the female is wider than on the male, as you can see, darker and wider. And then if you look at that hind wing, do you notice how he has a spot on his hind wings, these two spots here? And so that's how you can tell. Now, one of our local scientists was actually studying about mating choices, and he found that the females actually prefer the strongest males that are the biggest males. So that's kind of interesting because they need to fly and travel and have a long journey in parts of their lives. So what they do in the spring and summer is rather different than what they do in the fall and winter. And so as it gets to be colder, the butterflies have their hormones changing and shifting within their bodies and they get into something called reproductive diapause. They're pausing or waiting before they reproduce. And as their hormones shift, now they begin to eat lots and lots and lots of nectar from the flowers and they get really fat. They're converting the sugars into fat and you can actually see it in their little abdomen, how much fatter they are. It's like a bear getting ready for winter, very similar. Because where they have been, it's going to freeze and they can feel that before the frosts come. If it freezes on them, they will die. And so they have to get out of there and get to a place where it's warmer and sunny, or even if it's not sunny, where it doesn't freeze. So as you look at this map, you see they're leaving the northern areas, the center part of the country, and going to places where it won't freeze for the wintertime. If you look at the map on the bottom, you can see the line along the coast of California. And these are the, where the overwintering sites are, the places where the butterflies come to spend the winter, where they won't freeze. And natural bridges being right next to the ocean, this is a butterfly view. You can see how it's much more appealing to be in the park than in town. However, in the fall, they're all over town drinking nectar from people's flowers in their garden. Yet the trees in the grove in the middle of the park are very, very important and that's where they spend the winter. And the ringing trees all around the park on the ocean side help to block the winds because monarchs don't like the wind. Every grove up and down California historically up to 300 sites, has a component of some milk, some, sorry, um, eucalyptus within the grove. And it's interesting because eucalyptus isn't from California. Eucalyptus was planted by people. Who planted it? Well, people that didn't like to have the marshy areas and they wanted to have them dry up and also people who wanted a wind block. And so it's perfect for the monarchs. Not only are the leaves narrow enough that they can put their feet around them and cling on to the, the branches and the leaves and each other making clusters, but also there's some nectar source in the wintertime. So the, the best groves for the monarchs are the ones that are in circles of trees or ellipses. And with the opening in the middle, it allows the sun to shine in and the butterflies can find a place with the right conditions, a little bit like Goldilocks. Is it just the perfect spot for us to be safe? And as they start to arrive into the grove, it feels like a magic forest. All the butterflies starting to arrive. And then they're, they're sunning themselves early in the morning so that they can fly into the gardens nearby and get some nectar to be able to survive the winter in the trees. The butterflies we found from science experiments that below 45 degrees, they can't fly. They can't even move, not even a leg. And below 55, they can't make their wings work and they can't fly. But over 55, 
they're able to fly. So here in Santa Cruz is the perfect temperature. They don't have to fly a lot, but if they need to, there are warm enough days that they can fly. Now in the cluster, are they really clustering to get warm? Are they clustering for safety? What are they doing here? Well, it took a scientist asking this question and putting a thermometer inside the center of a cluster to learn that yes, as insects, they don't create any temperature heat themselves. And so the clusters are actually a survival mode to find each other at the end of the season, to be together, safety in numbers, things like that. Um, but it's not for warmth per se, except where they choose to cluster, and that is in the places that are a little bit warmer where they won't freeze. Now, having the eucalyptus is really important for the butterflies that didn't quite get enough nectar. They can drink the nectar and um, continue to live through the winter and go back into the clusters and try not to move too much unless there's a storm that makes them have to move where they are. Um, they try not to move too much and waste that energy. Now, there was a scientist, perhaps your age, perhaps a bit younger than you. He was about 10 when he had the question that became the, his science question. And his question was, here in the summer, up above the Great Lakes in the eastern part of Canada where I live, in the fields, there's lots and lots of monarchs. But at the end of summer, every year, they leave. Where are they going to? Why do they leave me? I would like to know. So he became a scientist and this was his study question. And he tried to figure out how would I be able to test for this? What do you think he might have done? Well, he knew that on the coast of California, up and down, like here at Natural Bridges, there are overwintering sites, the sites where the monarchs cluster for the wintertime. And if he could have something that he could put on the butterflies that people could find and see, then maybe they would know that it came from him. And with a telephone number on it, they would be able to find him. And if it had an individual code number on it, then he would know exactly which butterfly and exactly where it was tagged. So it took a while for him to figure this out. And the tags were very difficult because the adhesive, the, the stickiness wasn't very good back then. And year after year, decade after decade, month after month, time after time, he sh showed people how to tag butterflies up in Ontario in the middle of the country, all over showing them how he did his study. And it wasn't until this picture and this day that he finally found where his butterflies were going. So you can see he's a lot older than 10 years old in this picture. In fact, he had to wait almost 50 years to really know where his butterflies were going. And how he found out was with his tags, but also these two folks, Catalina Trail and her husband, Kenneth Brueger, were Mexican scientists leaving Mexico City and going in the winding roads up into the high country in Michoacan. Um, kind of to the west of where they lived. And up in the high country, they noticed on the roadside and coming across the roads, they had to be really careful because there was lots and lots and lots of butterflies flying across the road. Well, they had heard about Mr. Urquhart's, Dr. Urquhart's study, and they were curious, do you think this is maybe where the butterflies are coming? So they went up into town and it was right around the day of the dead. And they asked the people in town, are there places where the butterflies are clustering? And the people were very quiet at first because they didn't know who these people were. And around the day of the dead, they say in those areas that the loved ones come back on butterfly wings because year after year, the butterflies return at the time they celebrate their loved ones. So they were a little reluctant to say, but finally somebody took them up and Catalina and Kenneth saw the clusters for the first time. So they looked around and they thought they might see a tag. They weren't sure it was his. And they called Mr. Urquhart, Dr. Urquhart. Mr. Urquhart, they said, we think that we have found your butterflies. He quickly hopped on a plane and flew in to see. And sure enough, they found those tags. Well, he had been teaching a lot of people about tagging. And so a lot of people knew about this. But the rest of the world that hadn't been involved in this learned about it from 1976 National Geographic article and the study that he had finally found the answer to. So now maps could be drawn showing lines like this, where were the butterflies going to? And so that's how we get the lines on the map are from studies like this, tagging butterflies, 
watching them, following them. I always love this, the story that I saw in one time people were writing back and forth about where the butterflies were. And somebody said, the butterflies are about one week late in Aunt Lily's purple bush. So you see, it doesn't take scientists. It takes all of us noting and looking and putting a spot on the map to show where the butterflies are going to make a map like this. Now, some of those old tags that Mr. Urquhart had, some of the people he taught how to tag used them. They took butterflies with tags that were tagged east of the Rocky Mountains, and they moved them over to the west side of the Rocky Mountains. The question they were asking was, is it a location or is it a condition? What I mean by that is a location would be some kind of instinctual memory my great great grandparents were in this same forest, in these same trees, in this same area. Maybe there's some kind of a smell, like the salmon can find the rivers where they were born by smell taste kind of thing. Or maybe it's something like that. So that would be a location. Or is it a condition? The sun angle is low in the sky. It is showing us the south and the west. If we follow the sun, we'll get to a place where there are groves of trees perhaps in a place where we would be able to survive winter without freezing. And so they left the tag butterflies on the west side of the Rocky Mountains. All the wind goes to the east, all the water goes to the east, all the wind goes to the west, all the water goes to the west. And so it's called the Great Divide because it doesn't pass over the top. And perhaps that was why the butterflies weren't crossing over up in the mountains. So where do you think they went? Well, if you guessed that it was a condition, you were right. A little bit like Goldilocks. Is it too windy? Is it too cold? Is it too hot? Is it just right? And that's what they were doing. They're very visual. They see about as well as we do from a plane, perhaps not as clearly in their vision, but they can see very well. And they can follow the rivers. They can follow the highways that look a lot like rivers. And they can go down into the towns and forests and neighborhood areas and wild spaces to find flowers as they make their journey. It may take them a month, but it would take us in a car about driving all day and night, all of today, all of last night, and most of yesterday to drive. So here they found this answer, it was condition. Now another scientist very recently had a similar question, but you notice the tag is rather different. Because our adhesives are so much better nowadays, they can make smaller tags. And of course, now it has an internet, um, um, a, a, sorry, an email rather than a phone number on the tags. So this is Dr. James, Dr. Do David James, and he is up in Eastern Washington. He got citizens to um, do community science and they raised up monarchs and they let them go tagging them before they release them with these tags. And where do you think they were found? They were up in Eastern Washington, following the conditions, trying to find a place. You guessed it, perhaps, natural bridges. And if you guess natural bridges, you're correct because we found the tags, some of them here at the park. They were coming to natural bridges. It was the right condition. They were able to stay here. So. Everyone who was involved in that study was amazed, excited, and really enjoyed knowing, and the science community enjoyed knowing, that actually the Eastern butterflies, Eastern Washington butterflies, come to natural bridges for the winter, as well as a few other places too. Now, it was a bit before Dr. James's study um, in the 1990s, when people started asking, well, what about the other direction? Okay, now we have these lines on the map that take us to the coast, to Mexico, we understand where they're coming to. But what about going inland? What is happening there? What are the butterflies doing? And so people have been following milkweed and noting milkweed um, over time if they have it in their yards or their neighborhood or around and they see the butterflies come through, but they really wanted to do something that would be scientific and to really know where the butterflies are going. So they decided Let's use five different locations. Natural Bridges was one of them. And this is the way the tags looked, a lot more like Dr. Urquhart's tags put over the top of the wing. And in five locations along the coast of California, butterflies were tagged, returned to the same grove they came from, 
allowed to be there for the rest of the winter undisturbed. And then the butterflies went off on their own. Where were they going? Where was milkweed important? This was the big question that we didn't have the answer to. And people started to call in and tell us that they were here in the Bay Area and into the San Joaquin Valley from natural bridges tagging. So we learned that the milkweed they were finding was the closest milkweed in the Bay Area to where we were. Is that what you had guessed? Well, you were right if you did. Now it takes a number of generations moving inland to be able to get to follow the milkweed, follow the flowers. I like to call it chasing spring. You know, honestly, that's a little bit like I am. I love to chase spring and I love flowers. So I feel a little bit like the monarchs in that way. So each generation takes about a month and they go inland finding places with milkweed where they can lay their eggs and the whole life cycle takes place. So the milkweed in the Bay Area, the ones that are in like the San Jose area, looks like this. It has very, very narrow leaves, not very much food value, but every milkweed has the same shaped flower. So if you look at the flower cluster and you see it has a crown of five petals and five little scoopy petals coming down, then you know that it's milkweed. And if you're not quite sure and you bend a leaf and there's a little milkiness comes out, then you know for sure that it's milkweed. And that's what people have been noticing over time that the monarchs are, monarchs are using. If you are so lucky and you do have milkweed plants and you live a little bit inland, you may able, be able to see this. If you're really quiet and you don't move, the female pounds the leaf with her feet and she curls her abdomen, the back part of her body, underneath the leaf to lay an egg. She's a very good mother and leaves the, the caterpillar the egg behind that will become a caterpillar with everything it needs, the shelter of the plant, the food it has, everything it needs, but she has 100 to 400 eggs to lay. So she can't be there watching it like human mothers can or human parents can. She has to go elsewhere to take care of her, laying all these eggs and the eggs grow up themselves. And I'll show you, this is magnified. Normally it would be about the size of the comma on your, on your um, computer screen but I love the structure of it. It's so beautiful. I wanted to share that with you. And as you notice the caterpillar coming out, it doesn't have the characteristic colors of a monarch caterpillar when it first emerges. It eats its eggshell, but it hasn't taken a bite of the milkweed yet. And after it starts eating milkweed and it molts, it sheds its skin, then that tiger stripes of the yellow and black and the white too, that's so characteristic of the monarch caterpillar start to show and every, um, stage after that as they grow bigger and molt and 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 grow bigger and molt, five different stages, they all look like this, the other stages. So in that fifth instar or fifth stage, this is a ch child's hand. So if you are small, it might be the length of your pointing finger, this caterpillar is. Or if you're a big person like me, it might be your little finger is the length of this caterpillar. And this is what's super important. Monarchs in this largest stage need to eat the most. It isn't because they're the biggest, it's because if they don't eat enough, they will be stunted. If they're stunted, it means that they have smaller wings. It means that they're less able to have a really good healthy life. So it's super important that they get enough food at this stage. And here you can see all the looks of the caterpillars as they grow up. Now, what's kind of fun is to think about if you started the size of the egg and grew to be the, as big as, as the caterpillar here at the end, you might become the size of a bus. So the silk button is spun at the top, the caterpillar hangs upside down, and just take a quick look at what all happens. So I hope that I've inspired you with these pictures to think about not only taking your own pictures, but perhaps helping the monarchs in having their whole life cycle. If you live right near the coast, then you probably want to have nectar sources for the monarchs. And if you live inland a little bit, then the milkweed is incredibly important. Now this map, if you think about each band between the orange lines, this is about a generation growing up, one of those life cycles, and it, then the grandchildren, 
the great grandchildren, and then the great great grandchildren. But it doesn't happen just to the east, it also happens to the north, as we know from that study in Washington, they're coming from the north. And each generation is about a month and moving inland, they're finding the flowers. So by end of April, everything dries up. They have to go inland or north. By the end of May, where they were growing up, for their children to have milkweed, they need to move inland. And then by the end of June, they have to get up into the high country. And that's when I don my backpack and I go up into the high mountains in the Sierra Mountains, the Cascades or the Rocky Mountains, because that's where the flowers are still blooming. And that's where the butterflies are finding that milkweed and the flowers that they need. So you might have been asking yourself, is it ethical to tag a butterfly? And I would say it throws them off balance a little bit. If you weigh 100 pounds, it would be like wearing one tennis shoe on one foot and no tennis shoe on the other foot. So you see you're a little bit off balance. When science questions are asked and we learn a lot of new information and it's really important information that people haven't ever known before. And it means a difference in how we can care for the animals like where is milkweed important or where are they going to, then we can help to preserve these places and take care of them. And so in that way, having the tags and other experiments like that has helped us know a lot to be able to take care of these animals too. And natural bridges, we were known for the 70s and 80s and into the 90s for huge numbers of monarchs. Not as many as in Mexico, because there's a lot more milkweed in the mid Midwest and East of the United States and up into Canada than in the West there is. But, and a lot more room for butterflies to grow up too. Um, but in California, natural bridges had huge numbers, 150,000 monarchs is what you're seeing here in these huge clusters, probably taller than you are high. And at the end of March, when the willows would bloom, the butterflies would be ready to leave. And over time, we've seen that this has changed a little bit. Into the late 90s, we still had lots of clusters and lots of butterflies here at natural bridges. But when they did that study of where were the butterflies going and milkweed important, it was very, very important because knowing that it's the Bay Area and into the San Joaquin Valley makes us know that we can look and see where we need more milkweed. Now this year, we had 550 butterflies come. This is just one of the clusters, but you can see how much smaller the clusters are nowadays than they used to be. It's still amazing, it's still remarkable, it's still a mystery, it's still fantastic, but the monarchs need our help. And this is where you can come in and you can help too. Those roadsides and railroad tracks, when the numbers dropped, it was because they were herbicided with Roundup. It used to be that milkweed grew along all the roadsides. It was also in the open fields and the orchards, but now those are businesses, pavement and backyards. If you live there and have a backyard or some business or library or schoolyard, you can help with milkweed. Or if you live inland, of course, milkweed is also important because that's where the grandchildren will grow up. Here on the coast, we were having troubles in a lot of groves because the trees were getting older, branches were breaking, trees were falling down and spaces were open to the wind and monarchs don't like wind. You can start to see some of the sky showing through where at Natural Bridges, it used to be a wall of green. And now some of the sky is showing through. So places where they used to cluster aren't the same places that they're clustering now as where they were before. They have to find places that are a little more sheltered within the grove. And so what did we do? We had a lot of people like yourselves from the community coming and joining in on a lot of tree planting. We planted trees all the way around the edge. There used to be pine trees that had, many of them had died. And so we planted in the closest to bee native, which is the cypress. The tines, we don't have any that wouldn't get the disease that they got that killed them. So we wanted to make sure we had trees that would be successful and help. And now these trees are very large, like way, way, way over your head, helping to block the winds, helping to protect the trees that protect the grove and the monarchs from the wind. So with the milkweed, there's also a concern. If you don't have enough milkweed, the caterpillars don't have enough food. And sometimes when the females are laying eggs, they don't realize that they laid an egg on that same plant or maybe a different 
different monarch comes by to the same plant to lay an egg. And they call this egg dumping when the females have so many eggs and no milkweed to lay their eggs on. And so they place too many eggs on a plant and then maybe none of these would survive because there's not enough food. So my hope is that this is actually near somebody's neighborhood garden inland where all these caterpillars can crawl off a short distance and find more milkweed. Or perhaps right next to this plant, there's many more plants where they can find food to survive. But it is really dire and really important for them to find lots of milkweed. Now, a role of a butterfly is not only to be beautiful and to inspire us, but also for pollination. And so it's very important that we have clean flowers for the monarchs as well as clean milkweed. And what I mean by that is that the butterflies are passing um, the pollen from one flower to another to make fruits and vegetables and things that we love. Also make seeds for the flowers so they can continue with their young. But also the butterfly gets some energy from all this. And if the flower is poisoned, the butterfly will die. There is something that I'm just learning about that is really important to know about. You may wanna take a screenshot of this because at the bottom are the names that are being used. There's a chemical called a neonicotinoid. It's nicotine from tobacco. It's been known for a really long time. That's a very, 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 very um, deadly poison for insects. It's incredibly harmful to our pollinators. Our bees are getting lost because of neonicotinoids. And so, and the butterflies are affected too. It's called organic because it's a natural insecticide coming from a plant. It's not a chemical that people made themselves. And so instead of calling it a neonicotinoid when some of us would know, instead they're calling them these names at the bottom which are hard to pronounce. But these are the names you'll find in the list of ingredients. So if you have a poison that you wanted to put on and you said organic might be the best way to go, I have a really big problem with my, my rose bushes, what can I use? please, please look at the ingredient list and make sure it doesn't have any of these names on it. And in fact, you know, soap and water has proven to be the very best at getting rid of insects. And also a little bit of squishing with gloves on if you don't like to squish. Now, cleaning the milkweed can be very important. Um, if they grew up in a nursery and there was any poisons around, they might there might've been some poison drift onto the plants. And so before you plant them in the yard, it's really good to give them a big spray down, maybe even soap and water and spray it down um, without getting the soap into the ground. Um, and this is also true for getting rid of a disease that the monarchs can get. This is called OE. The big part, the circles are scales of the monarch, but the little dots are the OE. It's a protozoan that gets inside the, the the caterpillars when they eat the leaves. So if you wash your leaves, then they won't have such a much trouble, so much trouble. And this is what happens if you have a really infected butterfly, it can never emerge. And from the caterpillar, you can't tell, but if you know that your leaves are clean, you know that you're helping those caterpillars have good, healthy food, just like we would want. Another problem that's happened recently is Although yellow jackets have been around for a long time, their numbers are getting bigger as our falls are getting warmer on the coast near these overwintering sites. And then the paper wasp is a very new introduced species into this area. And the paper wasps, like the yellow jackets too, are meat eaters. They are voracious, they are hungry, they go out and they can eat caterpillars and butterflies. And so if you have a bird box and you're hoping to have birds come to have their young in it, or you have a butterfly box or a bat house or even eaves on your own roof, please make sure that you remove any of these so that we don't have um, the paper wasps killing all the butterflies that you're trying to grow up. So you can really help. Wherever you live, monarchs and other butterflies need flowers. They see best into ultraviolet, which is closest to purples, and they love big, heavy butterflies, butter by flowers like the sunflower type that you see here um, and butterfly bush and other things like that. And of course the milkweed we talked about inland. And there's all these different butterflies that might come to visit your yard. So what can we do? Well, please, if you could share with others the magic of the monarchs, the beauty of them and why we should care and help them have a clean, safe life and about that organic poisoning 
um, with neonicotinoids, that would really help. Making a habitat for them is really helpful. If you don't have a sunny spot to plant milkweed and you don't live about five miles or more inland from the coast, think about nectar plants. And then think about encouraging other people there was somebody from Google that came to a program of mine and he went back to the Bay Area and he planted in a little milkweed garden and he inspires all the people at his work by bringing in caterpillars, chrysalises and butterflies to show them how important milkweed is and to make a difference. So that's just one person and there's lots of people out there helping, perhaps even you. And please, if you wanna get involved with a scientist, it's really, really helpful to have your help with monitoring and documenting. It just takes a camera to take a picture. And iNaturalist is a free app for your phone from the California Academy of Sciences. And it's a wonderful, wonderful app to have because not only are you giving information to the scientists, but if you're curious, what is this plant? What is this insect? What am I seeing? Then it will have scientists tell you what you are seeing as well as you giving information about monarchs and milkweed. There's a program called Milkweed Mapper, if you look at that on the internet, and that's a wonderful thing to see where is their milkweed. And people like yourselves are taking pictures with a location, a GPS location, and sending it off to scientists and saying, here's where the milkweed is. And so if you want to get involved in that, that's really a help. There's also the Western Monarch Mystery Challenge. There's even prizes. That's out of Washington State University. That professor I told you about was really curious about where they go when they leave the overwintering site. So you can be part of all of the answers that we now can learn. And Journey North is a wonderful map showing both the East and the West populations as they move through the different months. And you can see every dot. And maybe you'll be with some of the people that put those dots on the map, showing where milkweed is and showing where the monarchs are. So that would be fantastic if you can get involved. There's also proposed legislation. It's not yet in um, the, our legislators in California are deciding right now if these should be passed or not. There's a Monarch Act and a Highway Pollinator Act. And I encourage you to look these up and see if they are things that you would like to support. And if so, you can contact your legislator. Um, our legislator, um, Panetta, um, was one of the people involved and it is a bipartisan proposed legislation. And this would be to get nectar sources and milkweed and protect the overwintering sites. So it's not only the milkweed that's needed, but all butterflies need our help. And our hope is that you can get inspired and help some of the science to help get some of the answers to the questions we've asked. And hopefully the monarchs will add a little bit of light and lightness to your life and that you can see them grow up, fly through your world and have them in your world. And we welcome you to Natural Bridges anytime you want to. Um, the, the months that they're usually here is they start to arrive in September and they're usually nowadays gone by February. But we don't really know. Numbers have dropped and this is why we have the plea. Please help us with getting what they need so that they can survive. We can see the numbers get bigger because if those females with 400 eggs find enough milkweed, then the population can grow and we can see more butterflies in the future and in your future. If you want to see more about the amazing Mexican monarch groves, I just gave you a few seconds of that hummingbird drone video. But if you search for that, you can find a whole video about it, quite interesting. Another one that's a very compelling video is called The Day of the Dead, Monarch Butterfly Migration to Michoacan. And if you look on YouTube for both of these videos, then um, you can see more of this amazing monarch butterfly life and congregation down in Mexico. So thank you for joining me today as we learn a little bit about and we explore where do the monarchs go? Where are they coming from? Where are they going to? And where is their path? And how do we know what we know? Perhaps some of you will be the scientists making these questions and more questions in the future answered with new answers that we don't even know about yet. So I hope that you keep asking questions. I hope that you keep helping us find out where the monarchs